Welcome back to South African Research Chair's Initiative. Osachi Chairperson of Viral Host Dynamics at the University of the Witwatersrand says studies of blood taken from 44 people who previously had COVID-19 show that their antibodies are much less effective against uh, the 501YV2. Professor Penny Moore uh, says the question now arises whether the antibodies of people who were infected with the original variant are able to recognize the new one. As, as the second batch of Johnson & Johnson vaccines has arrived in the country, the 80,000 doses are due to be sent to a secure location. Professor Helen Rees is chair of the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority, among other things, and she joins us now. Very good evening to you, Professor Rees. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Mm. So I just thought I should ask you about the study because, uh, I mean, as we accept the second batch of uh, vaccine in South Africa, uh, the question is, as I mentioned, the ability to resist reinfection, that's top of mind. So just take us through the current uh, context, just in terms of the rollout of the vaccine and also the impact of the variant. Well, uh, first of all, the, the, the good thing about the J&J &J vaccine is that it's one of the few vaccines that we have clinical data for in the context of the new variant. Um, the data suggests that the vaccine is, has an overall effectiveness of 64%, but is uh, even more effective against preventing severe disease. And that clinical data was, was obtained in the contents, context of of our new variant. So that's for the J&J &J vaccine. So that's very good news. The, certainly we, we are concerned about um, all the vaccines and our new variant and how effective they're going to be. Um, but the vaccines that we're looking at now, perhaps hopefully soon, such as Pfizer, these are highly immunogenic vaccines. We have seen a, reduce, a reduction in their ability to neutralize uh, the, 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 the virus in the laboratory. Um, and so what we're going to be looking at is, is what does that mean clinically? Because we don't know what the laboratory findings mean and how they translate into clinical implications. Mm. So all of that is going to be ongoing work. Mm. So are there any new findings from the genomics team doing research here in South Africa on the new variant? And what needs to happen now? Uh, as you say, we will be looking at receiving different vaccines, and I would imagine that the uh, dosage also differs, uh, storage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How does this impact on our rollout? Yes, well, it, it's not going to impact on the rollout. We're not putting the brakes on the rollout at all. So the J&J &J rollout is going to continue. They're going to be continuous um, uh, doses and lots of vaccine imported on a regular basis, sort of week by week. Um, and we're going to continue to target the healthcare workers. What we are doing is collecting data on hospitalization. So people who've had the vaccine, we will be looking at, um, at rates of hospitalization of people who've had the vaccine versus people who haven't had the vaccine. Um, and uh, we're, we're also going to be looking at what we call breakthrough infections. So we'll be looking hard at anybody who's had the vaccine and then becomes infected, and we'll be looking at what, what is that virus. So all of that work is ongoing. Um, the Pfizer vaccine, we're also, there are advanced negotiations there, and we're hoping, and SAPRA is also looking at the Pfizer vaccine. So we're hoping that we will also have that vaccine. Um, and again, we don't have clinical data on its effectiveness mm. against the new variant, but we will be generating that data. So at the moment, although we are concerned and we're looking hard, we, we are not putting the brakes on um, either J&J &J or purchasing um, other vaccines as well. That is going to go full steam, but we will be looking closely at the clinical data as it emerges. Mm -hmm. and, and new data, as you mentioned, on the efficacy of the J&J &J vaccine has just been released. Now, I want you to then talk about this new, uh, new variant, which uh, according to some of the research that I've seen, that there's been between something like 10 and 20 new mutations. How true this and what are the implications for uh, the endpoints? Because the definitions there of from the past conversations you and I have are very important. 
So the, the variant that we're looking at in South Africa hasn't changed from the one that was described um, the, 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 um, before, uh, that we, we noted before Christmas and that started in Nelson Mandela Bay. That is the one that we're looking at. What we are seeing worldwide is that other new variants are emerging and a lot of them are starting to show similar changes. They're moving in the same direction as the 501YV2, the one we have here in South Africa, because this is obviously an advantage to the virus. It makes the virus more transmissible and it also makes it more resistant to antibodies. But as I say, what we don't know, there's a big gap between knowing that and knowing how effective the vaccines will be. The J&J, &J, we do have data to suggest that it's going to have clinical effectiveness. And that's in the context of the new variants. So people should be reassured. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine that we're negotiating is highly, highly immunogenic. It really kicks the, the immune system. There are changes and drops in its ability to neutralize antibody in, in the laboratory, but we don't know what that means for clinical. So I just want to reassure everyone, we're looking at this all the time. There are discussions that are ongoing between South African scientists and we'll be having uh, next week um, about what are the clinical studies that we need to do as we get new vaccines in. But in no way should we stop. The, the, the quicker we can get the vaccines out, even if they're less effective than they would have been against the original strain that we had, um, it's going to be critically important that we do that. Mm. The, the, the higher the number of cases we have, the more likely we're going to see additional variants emerging. And we need to stop that from happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also want to get a sense of where the research is going to move to. I mean, uh, they say that the notion that SARS uh, COVID 2 will be eradicated is probably not realistic. Uh, the lack or incomplete data in the trials of the vaccines has presented a problem, which is why we find ourselves where we are. So where would the post-infection endpoints then lead us, for instance? Would there be some sort of randomized um, cluster tests? Um, so the sort of studies that we're, we're, we're probably going to be looking at are the kinds that we're seeing doing with J&J &J now, looking at hospitalization and severe disease as a, an important endpoint and looking at breakthrough infections. Those are going to be important. Um, one thing I should add though, is that for both J&J &J and Pfizer and Moderna and a number of the other vaccines, Novavax, these are all some of the advanced vaccines that are becoming available. They are all also modifying their vaccines to address the variant that originated in South Africa, 501YV2. So they're all changing their vaccines. The Pfizer, the Pfizer change for the variant will come quite quickly. It'll take longer to, to be able to change and manufacture the J&J. &J. But we are going to see that the vaccine manufacturers are going to be changing vaccines to keep up with mm. the changes that we're seeing worldwide. So I, I, as I say, I think people should be reassured that, uh, that, 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 that not only are the current vaccines in the J&J &J in particular has been shown to be effective in this setting, um, but also that there are the manufacturers are changing the vaccines. So we're going to be keeping talking to them, the manufacturers, and, and identifying which are the best vaccines for our setting as time goes on. Okay. So updating of those vaccines periodically, how huge a cost will it be? And especially against the backdrop that we've won a very important coup, India and South Africa, and fighting for uh, the IP on the manufacturing of these vaccines. Yes, well, I think that, that, that there's now a view, as you said um, earlier on, that this is not going to be a virus that we're going to quickly get rid of. Uh, that's, that one scenario could be that the virus keeps changing and it becomes something that becomes more like seasonal influenza that we see changes every year, that this virus manages to adapt and change and that we have to keep changing the vaccines and offering people boosters. So that is one scenario that's 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 possible um and we're going to have to think about that in terms of ongoing costs because if we do need to give boosters on a regular basis um, over a period of years to stop uh, this the the circulation of of the the covid 19 virus then that is is something that we're obviously going to have to consider certainly at the moment we're looking at the original vaccines these are the ones that we have available but it might well be that when we get the, the vaccine that's been redesigned to address the variant, that we would then see whether we need to offer a booster with a vaccine like that 
to, to make sure that we've got optimal coverage against the local variant. Thank you so much for your time and insights, Professor Helen Rees, Chair of the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority on uh, the latest uh, scientific data that's available as South Africa receives its second batch of uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccines.